right. Mostly from NGOs today. We'll welcome everyone. All right, so to kick things off, um, I want to officially uh, welcome everyone on behalf of the Fossil Fuel Nonproliferation Treaty Initiative for the Special Climate Week event. And first, I want to introduce our moderator, Sapora Berman. Sapora is the International Program Director at Stand Up Earth, the chair of the Fossil Fuel Nonproliferation Treaty Committee, as well as the co-chair of the Global Gas and Oil Network, and an adjunct professor of York University Faculty of Environmental Studies. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Sapora. Thank you, Meredith, and thank you everyone for joining us this morning. I know it's been a long uh, virtual climate week, and we appreciate you joining us for this conversation. As part of the reconciliation process here in Canada at Stand Earth, we're committed to recognizing Indigenous territories. So today I'm speaking to you from Vancouver, the unceded territory of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish First Nations. For those who'd like to join us in recognizing their, whose territory uh, they are on, um, in the chat we'll put a, a link uh, to nativelands.ca where you can do that for yourself. So Meredith, if you could turn uh, to the uh, slide on the World Economic Forum report. I wanna to start today um, uh, by recognizing um, what we all know here at Climate Week, that the lack of action on climate change is now the greatest threat facing humanity. In fact, the World Economic Forum report um, now has failure to act on climate change as the greatest and most likely threat to humanity, replacing nuclear weapons. So despite the global climate emergency, the fires, the floods, the droughts, the heat waves, the world continues to expand the production of oil, gas, and coal. Despite the fact that we have 120% more expansion planned than the world can burn under a 1.5 degree scenario. We know now that the world has enough fossil fuels already in production and construction to make the transition to clean, low carbon energy. During this session, we're gonna be exploring the need for international cooperation to align fossil fuel production with Paris Agreement goals, as well as the concept of a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty as a vehicle to spur that cooperation. It's modeled after global action to tackle the production of nuclear weapons because the climate emergency requires the same sense of urgency and massive undertaking as those weapons of mass destructions took as did phasing out CFCs to protect the ozone layer, asbestos to protect health, banning landmines and many other examples. When I first started working on climate change, I actually, I thought the reason that Canada was expanding oil sands so quickly in the face of climate change was in large part because we had a government that didn't believe in climate change. Many of you will remember um, our Prime Minister at the time, Prime Minister Harper, was well known for referring to Kyoto as a socialist scheme to suck money out of good people. Um, that kind of rhetoric may sound familiar to our US colleagues who are here. But then we elected a government that believes in climate change, has enacted quite strong climate legislation, and the expansion of oil and gas has continued. The Trudeau government has even increased fossil fuel subsidies. And in some cases, when investors pulled out of big new fossil fuel projects, our government bought them, like the Trans Mountain Pipeline, to make sure fossil fuel expansion would go forward. Shockingly, climate policy at a domestic and international level has been designed to only address emissions. Governments argue that they're not responsible for the production of fossil fuels. I, I'll never forget the day that I searched through the Paris Accord to find out that the words oil, gas, coal, fossil fuels don't even appear. So the result, Canada is now, um, uh, oil, oil and gas production in Canada is now the largest and fastest growing source of our emissions. So that's why we're here today. No one country wants to constrain production. We hear it wouldn't be fair, wouldn't, we wouldn't be competitive, but we can't ensure a safe climate and focus on building solutions if we're still pouring all of our political and intellectual um, and financial capital into expanding oil, gas, and coal. We have a system where we know fossil fuels are 80% of the climate problem, and currently we don't constrain fossil fuel production. There are very few mechanisms within the Paris Accord. Domestic climate policy rarely includes supply side measures. The markets are starting to. We're seeing new announcements every day, but the markets alone will not ensure expansion is stopped fast enough nor that equity is taken into consideration. Today, youth are striking around the world and they know this. 
Millions taking action in their homes to stop fracking, pipelines, new oil drilling from the Arctic to the Amazon know this. Indigenous leaders around the world fighting for their rights, their homes, and their way of life know this. So today we're going to talk about the emissions and equity challenges related to fossil fuel production, as well as the emergence of the Fossil Fuel Treaty as a way to foster international collaboration. We're excited to have an incredible group of panelists joining us with special guest appearances by Bill McKibben and Naomi Klein. Starting us off today, I'd like to introduce you to Rebecca Burns, the Deputy Director of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty to give us an overview of the initiative. Rebecca? Great, thanks very much, Zipporah. Um, so I'm Rebecca, I'm speaking from Ngunnawal country in Canberra, Australia. And I'm just gonna kick off by giving a brief overview of who we are and our work before handing over to all of the fantastic speakers that we've got lined up for today. So the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative is a coalition of civil society organizations, research institutions, grassroots activists, and other partners who are based all around the world. And in the context of the challenges that Zipporah just spoke to and the massive misalignment between fossil fuel production that is planned and what we can safely burn under a 1.5 degree goal, the goal of our coalition is to foster an equitable global transition away from fossil fuels through international cooperation by ending new fossil fuel development, phasing out existing production, and developing plans to support workers, communities, and countries that are dependent on fossil fuels to create secure and healthy livelihoods. So we've organized our work around three core areas, a diplomatic engagement strategy to engage progressive country governments to champion the need for international cooperation on fossil fuel supply, a campaign strategy to support movements around the world um, in holding go governments and corporations to account and in joining the call for a treaty and a research strategy which underpins all of this work. Now, of course, we recognize that negotiating a treaty takes time. And so as part of our diplomatic engagement strategy, we're working towards a series of building blocks with the aim being that each of these will elevate the issue of fossil fuel supply into the multilateral arena and pave the way towards a global treaty. These include a club of pioneering countries that are willing to champion the, the treaty effort, a global registry of fossil fuels, and a world commission on fossil fuels. And earlier this month, we actually publicly released our white paper on the global registry of fossil fuels. And this is really a core first building block in our strategy because while there are some, some very valuable existing private and civil society databases out there, there's no one comprehensive unified or um, government verified source of information on fossil fuels. And there's no obligation on governments to report this information. But what we've learned from other efforts to tackle global threats, some of which Sapporo just mentioned, and in particular, the proliferation of nuclear weapons, is that government transparency and accountability is a really vital foundation and a precursor for international cooperation. So we're working towards a country-driven, standardized and comprehensive global registry that will require countries to report both what coal, oil and gas reserves they have in the ground, but also what they plan to produce. So we can start to establish an international norm around government accountability and transparency on fossil fuels, and also build the baseline that we need to empower more strategic and rapid planning to avoid overshooting the 1.5 degree goal. Uh, our campaign strategy is also building momentum. Um, we're working with a really exciting, diverse coalition of groups and networks uh, with wide engagement from key constituencies around the world and strong representation in the global south with the aim to build a global chorus of voices that are all calling for a treaty. We have three concentric circles of ways that organizations can get involved. There's a core group of organizations devoting significant resources and who are part of the strategy effort for the campaign. We also have a network of key partners who will be running campaigns and including demands for a treaty and a broader movement of organizations, companies, cities, even states and eventually nations who will publicly endorse the treaty and amplify the call for a treaty. So we're aiming to build on the successful models of other major successful campaigns like the Nobel Prize winning landmines and nuclear campaigns, the insights to, into how to grow a global movement. And um, we've already had hundreds of organizations and individuals endorse the treaty. So if you're interested in being involved, 
you can endorse the treaty on our website, which is the link is on your screen, or you can get in touch at the, either of the email addresses on your screen as well. Um, and, and we can help you get engaged. So with that, I'll hand back over to Sephora to introduce our first panel. Thank you, Rebecca. So we have a very dynamic um, hour and a half for you, a, a, a large number of speakers. Thank you all uh, for joining us this morning. Our first panel will cover the challenge of fossil fuel production around the world and advancing an equitable energy transition. So I'm excited that we have today with us Dr. Katherine Harrison. Katherine is a professor of political science at the University of British Columbia. Lydia Napsil, Lydia is the coordinator of the Asia People's Movement on Debt and Development and the coordinator of the global campaign to demand climate justice. Carlos Larea, Dr. Larea is a professor of social studies at the University a Universidad Andean Simon Bolivar. Sanjan Vashist. Sanja, Sanjay is the Director of Climate Action Network South Asia. And Lily Fuhr. Lily is the Head of International Environmental Policy Division at the Heinrich Boll Foundation. David Tong. David is a Senior Campaigner at Oil Change International. And Mark Campanali, the Founder and Executive Director of the Carbon Tracker Initiative. So let me start with you, Catherine. The UNEP, Stockholm Environment Institute and others released the production gap report last year, which highlighted the lack of transparency, accountability and emissions from fossil fuel production. Can you, can you explain what the production gap is um, and its implications for staying uh, within the goal of no more than 1.5 C? And why are national governments failing to account uh, for the emissions that fossil fuel expansion would lock in? Sure thing. Um, I'd like to acknowledge first that my university is on the unceded ancestral territory of the Musqueam people. Um, so the UN has produced an annual emissions gap report for over a decade and that tracked the persistent gap between the emissions trajectory needed to achieve our climate goals of 1.5 or 2C and the emissions that are anticipated as a result of national policies. Uh, last year, for the first time, the production gap report complemented that ongoing analysis by thinking about the problem in a new way, rather than focusing on the point of fossil fuel consumption, which does account for thir three quarters of um, global greenhouse gas emissions. The production gap report shifted the focus upstream to the supply of fossil fuels and the emissions that can be anticipated when that supply is burned. And it turns out that that shift in our thinking is really important because the first production gap report found that the production gap is even bigger than the emissions gap. Planned production of fossil fuels in 2030 would yield emissions 50% more than the 2C pathway and more than double uh, what we can afford on the 1.5C pathway. And that's got lots of important implications. Um, I'll highlight a couple. Um, oversupply of fossil fuels tends to depress prices and that increases consumption. So even as governments are adopting policies to constrain consumption of fossil fuels, at the same time, they're in, in continuing to encourage supply and that undermines their climate policies. Um, the other thing is that we're continuing to lock in economic dependence on fossil fuel production through invest, investments in long lasting infrastructure. And that raises the specter of stranded assets when markets shift, or I think even worse, continued operation of those assets even as the world warms. Um, the second question that you asked Sapora was, how can we explain this gap between emissions and supply, um, you know, I think historically we've assumed that if we set policies to reduce consumption, markets for fossil fuels would just adjust automatically. And now we can see that that's not the case for a bunch of reasons, none of which are insurmountable. Um, the first and I think most important is the political influence of the fossil fuel industry, which is also very much locked in historically. Um, politicians have relied on development of domestic natural resources to create jobs, and they are very much reluctant 
to um, be the one to close down operations, especially in dependent communities. So they've locked that in through um, ownership of uh, fossil fuel enterprises, investment subsidies, um, and they're also often dependent on the revenues that come through taxes and royalties. Second of three, I'd say there's been lots of wishful thinking um, even if fossil fuel producers are anticipating a decline over time, they're all competing and they all hope that theirs is the last lump of coal or the last drop of oil that will be burned. Um, and I think even in anticipation of that decline, they're trying to get as much of their fossil fuel to market while they still can. And the final point I'd make is that um, I think a lot, of company, a lot of countries that rely on export of fossil fuels are hedging their bets on the Paris Agreement. And I think that's especially true for um, countries like Norway, Canada, OPEC states, Australia, that rely economically on export of fossil fuels. And that means that they prosper from the production of those fuels, but they're not accountable on their national inventories from the emissions that result when they're burned. Mm -hmm. So we see countries like Canada, as you mentioned, Sapora, highlighting their climate leadership in um, addressing their own emissions, even as they are expanding their production for export to other countries. Thank you, Catherine, that's really clear. So let me turn to you, um, uh, Liddy. Um, so can you speak to why is it important to center fossil fuel phase out and energy transition uh, in equity? And can, can you share your views on, on the ways in which promoting international cooperation can help address the energy transition issues in Asia? Uh, for many of us, uh, grassroots movements in the South, equity is such a central concern in how to address well, climate change in general and the energy transition in particular. First, because it's a matter of acknowledging the reality of inequality in our world. There is inequality not just in how nations and people have contributed to the climate change. There is inequality in terms of the impacts because there's other conditions that surround us that matter uh, in terms of how climate change impacts you. And it's also an acknowledgement that there should be be a fair way of solving this problem that acknowledges these inequalities. So if you have countries that contribute the most to the problem, have much bigger capacity to address the problem, then it just is a matter of principle to say, then they should have a, a bigger share of the burden of solving this problem. And that is part of what uh, a very much important part of it is the phase out of fossil fuels and the energy transition. But we're also speaking as a matter of practicality. Uh, the, the math will not add up if the, most, if, the, if the countries that contribute the most to the problem do not do a proportionate share of the solution, we will not arrive at the solution. We will not be able to keep temperature rise below 1.5 degrees. So much as we have a problem with the US, with Trump not wanting to uh, participate in the solution for climate change. I think as global citizens, we have a, a kind of urgent um, push and uh, duty to campaign that the US be, become part of the solution. So, you know, we're all looking at the national elections that are coming uh, in the US in a few weeks, is it? And so that's mm -hmm. uh, something that all citizens in the world are, you know, have huge stake in. The other thing is it's very important to have international cooperation efforts like this campaign, because from the point of view of campaigners in the South, unless it's something that's being discussed internationally, it's very difficult to get our governments to talk about these things. So it really helps us in campaigning on the ground if these issues are being discussed internationally in order to open wider the doors and opportunities for us to have direct conversations with our governments about these issues. But it also, hmm. of course, works vice versa. You need this push from below in order to get governments internationally to open up. But there's also some also very important things to stress on this. There's the psychology of governments. 
they're not going to do anything about something if they don't see others doing something, right? I mean, there's this kind of need to show that we're, we're, not, we're not just demanding this of you. It is a demand for all governments. And if they can see that there's, you know, in what we call first movers moving forward, then it, we can use that as leverage to push harder for governments to open up to this kind of initiative. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Liddy. I just want to remind people, if you have a question, if you could put it in the Q&A function, our panelists and, and um, uh, uh, folks who work for the treaty initiative will attempt to answer them as we go. Um, I'm going to ask Meredith the questions that have come into the chat, if you could put them into the Q&A function. And we're going to try and take as many as we can on the seminar. Um, but we will also, for those of you registered, be sending out the link to the seminar as well as answers that we weren't able to get to. Let me turn to you now, uh, Carlos. I'm hoping you have enough Wi-Fi that you can, there you go, turn on your great background, turn on your um, camera. Um, so how can international cooperation support the frontline communities you're working with um, in the Amazon and how is your research related? Thank you. Well, uh, I, in my opinion, international cooperation uh, will play and have been playing a very, very important uh, role in the fight against climate change and, and for indigenous people's rights as well as preserving biodiversity. I'm going to present some very relevant examples. In the case of Brazil, uh, uh, during the Lula administration, particularly between 2004 and 2012, deforestation uh, uh, dropped by about 85%. It was uh, the most successful uh, result, the most successful outcome on, in the fight against deforestation. And it was mostly the result of uh, a link between international cooperation, uh, mostly uh, from Norway and Germany. Uh, Brazil received about $1. billion dollars in international cooperation uh, to set up this important uh, outcome. A second example, after that, uh, the deforestation is rising again in Brazil and we have a very serious environmental problem. Now, President Macron in France has uh, opposed the signing of a free trade agreement between European Union and Mercosur. If Brazil doesn't stop uh, deforestation and forest fires. Those examples uh, it clearly point out the need for uh, uh, invigorating an agreement between international cooperation on the one hand and on the other hand indigenous peoples and environmental groups both uh, to stop uh, deforestation and keeping fossil fuels underground. Thank you, Carlos. Um, Sanjay, let's turn to you. Um, what are the key challenges in phasing out fossil fuels in South Asia? And, and, and what work is CAN South Asia doing uh, to combat this? What, what, what role do you think international cooperation can have in moving the needle on fossil fuel production? Thanks, Geoffrey. Yes, certainly. Um, let me uh, you know, start by uh, sharing uh, you know, how the uh, the projections are in South Asian countries. Bangladesh um, expectations, not expectations, basic projections are that from this year to uh, 2041, Bangladesh is going to add its coal uh, capacity to 35%. Pakistan, 12 to 19%. Um, India, not uh, big significant uh, uh, decrease, 56% to uh, 48%. While uh, on the contrary, renewable energy expansion is much slower compared to, um, compared to uh, uh, you know the way uh, 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 fossil fuel will increase. I also saw a question in the um, in the chat box uh, from Dr. Aditya Mishra uh, about how um, new uh, how to design a new and faster transition to a low carbon uh, future. Let me try to answer that as well while answering uh, you know uh, Zofra, the question that you put uh, in front of me. One biggest uh, uh, challenge is the technology. Um, the, so far, the technology is completely fossil fuel aligned. Um, we, we, our uh, grids are uh, totally reliant on 
on a centralized uh, power supply and and they are not certainly not smart grids that who can uh, receive uh, energy from renewable uh, source as well uh, so uh, the way uh, it is uh, very common in germany um, uh, given the uh, the way they have established a model we don't have that kind of uh, technology cost cost of alternative uh, energy is very high uh, at least the uh, the, the biggest challenge is the real cost of uh, energy like coal has not been assessed so uh, it's not competent enough um, now it is becoming affordable uh, but still um, for example environment co cost of uh, coal is never assessed uh, while calculating uh, the cost consumer awareness and mindset is is a problem we still uh, you know hope that we can continue to receive the way we have been receiving energy at residential areas or in industrial areas and we don't have uh, to install extra infrastructure at home um, for example maybe solar panels on the rooftop uh, fossil fuel lobby is very strong in in, uh, in south asian countries uh, and that act as a hindrance and of course investments are slow and there are many reasons why investments are slow and we are assessing it what kansa is doing it of course we have uh, you know spreading information we are uh, addressing myth to have a positive attitude uh, towards just transition and this is also an opportunity to define what just transition means and as lady pointed out uh, the transition should include equity um, so so uh, that's what we are working on we are also uh, working uh, with a multi stakeholder platform uh, on how investments can be facilitated in uh, south asian countries what kind of technological financial or environmental or social barriers are there that need to be addressed in terms of international cooperation what uh, we need in south asia first foremost please stop pumping dirty energy in developing countries we are not your backyard no more transfer of you know obsolete nuclear technology from japan to sri lanka we don't want that um, and if you think that moving to a clean energy by yourself and uh, leaving developing countries behind uh, you will not be able to achieve 1.5 degree temperature uh, cyclones uh, and other disasters will keep coming climate change cannot be addressed with green uh, clean and green energy uh, clean, uh, uh, transition by developing countries um, so please help developing countries climb the energy ladder where higher you go in hdi higher uh, uh, access uh, to the clean energy you have Uh, that's the part mm -hmm. that's also the equity issue here technological upgrade we need smart metering especially if you want to promote entrepreneur uh, model uh, in uh, south asian countries where a farmer can have windmill or a solar panel and can sell it to a grid we need smart metering we don't have that feed in tariff we don't have that kind of technology investment to support uh, renewable energy is must uh, and please help us to shift financial flows from fossil fuel to the uh, renewable energy so certainly um, as can south asia we do uh, demand that no more uh, investments in fossil fuel and uh, please work with us to phase out uh, from fossil fuel sooner thank you fantastic uh, sanjay that is ve uh, very clear um uh i'm going to move um now um uh i'm going to jump the uh, uh, lineup um and and move um to mark uh who has just joined us welcome mark um uh, uh thank you for joining us i know um that you have a board meeting today um and you're jumping in um to join us so we very much uh, appreciate it um we've been discussing the need for international cooperation um we've talked about the markets we've talked about the production gap we've talked about equity um and how important that is um in in dressing uh the production get got globally i want to bring you into the conversation while we have you uh for a couple of minutes um you know we know renewable energy is now affordable it's the affordable reliable option in many jurisdictions many energy forecasters have determined that 2020 is the year when demand for fossil fuels uh peaked but at the same time uh fossil fuel production continues to expand so can you talk a little bit about um what you see as you know have the markets failed to address the production gap and are there ways um in your opinion in which international cooperation can address um what we're seeing happen in the marketplace or complement it thank you zapora and thank you everyone for joining this webinar today it's a exciting time to be looking at the supply side of the equation because to date the part that the climate negotiations as we know and you probably already talked about the um, paris agreement doesn't mention the fossil fuels anywhere in it and it, it's a, if a point's been made before i'll make it again 
because um, it's, a, it's a huge, I think, error to think we can address climate change without talking about fossil fuels and without talking about planned supply. Um, and just to give some context, the International Energy Agency um, believes that there's around a trillion dollars invested annually into the fossil fuel production or the supply side. And even in BP's latest announcements um, about uh, their own planned production cuts, they, they're ready, the commentary is ready suggesting, even their commentary is suggesting there's going to be a further 10 to 30 trillion dollars invested in uh, new production. So um, we've got policymakers not looking at this side of the equation, and yet we've got to tackle fossil fuel supply. Uh, so the piece I want to talk about is um, the idea of the global registry, Zipporah, and, and this registry, uh, there is no registry globally that's publicly available that looks at all these planned investments, looks at who's producing the fossil fuel supply, and those who follow me on Twitter will know that I was tweeting just today about how the US and also the UK, the host of the COP next year or this coming year, um, has already issued new licenses up to $30 billion or $40 billion worth for oil and gas exploration. I mean, this is a, a huge disconnect. It's a form of a hypocrisy, I think, is a, one of the phrases I was using in my tweet. So the registry is really just, just to link up what governments are doing. On one side, they're saying they want to support emissions reduction, and yet on the other side, they're handing out new oil and gas exploration licenses or handing out new permits for, for coal mines or coal-fired power stations. And what the treaty will do and what the registry do will, will close that gap and, and provide support for um, civil society groups that want to put pressure on governments to uh, make sure that on one side they're not handing out new permits whilst telling everyone how keen they are to support the Paris goals. I mean, this you cannot reconcile the two. And so... Mm -hmm. um, the registry is such a crucial part of allowing civil society groups. It's going to be a registry of projected CO2 emissions. Track and our own work, um, we've published that there's something like seven times more proven reserves of coal, oil and gas that we can possibly burn to stay below 1.5 degrees. It's an insanity to think that we can keep investing more and expanding more production. So those are my comments, Zipporah. I don't know if, Thank if you. I've covered all of the ground that uh, you wanted me to, uh, but I'm a huge supporter of the treaty idea, uh, and I really welcome today's discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And I'm going to ask um, uh, Meredith uh, if you or others could put the link um, to the uh, Global Registry uh, white paper in the chat. Uh, Mark referred to it um, in his comments. Uh, I'm going to turn to um, to you uh, now, Lily. Um, can you uh, give us a um, a sense of what what should Germany and other wealthy producer countries um, be doing uh, to tackle the production gap? Yeah. Hello and good afternoon from Berlin. I'm very happy to be here and part of this conversation. So. Um, yeah, I mean, Germany is known as a country that leads on energy transition issues, but um, I hope that most people also know that we continue to be one of the biggest lignite producers in the world. Um, we love to be big on many things. So um, we're also a key player um, in, the German, um, in the German context, we're a key player in the European gas market. And our foreign policy you know, tends to be deeply linked to our dependency on fossil fuels, um, especially gas. So I think Germany, in this context can do really many great things. I think what we need to do in Germany right now, you know, we've started um, a discussion on a managed decline of coal. It's too little and too late right now, but we need to speed up that managed decline and align that with our parents' commitments and include all fossil fuels. So I would say um, here in Germany, we must not stop with coal. And, and that's a step that we still have to take. Um, and the debate around gas is only just starting. A second point is, thing, is that I think we need to align our international finance, our development assistance, our export credit schemes with those goals. And Carlos already um, alluded to that important um, link of international finance and assistance to other countries. And I think that's where Germany can and must play a key role. And that's part of the international 
um, debate. And I think a third piece um, is that we need to use our diplomatic influence, um, you know, and Germany does have that both in Europe and beyond, to get others to move as well. And I would hope that Germany would also put its, um, its, its, its you know, some of its weight behind um, the goals of the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, although I think we've still got a long way ahead of us for that. Um, you know, at the Heinrich Böll Foundation, we're so excited about this new initiative because we, I think we share the sense of frustration with many that, that for so many years, you know, when we go to the, the, to the UN climate negotiations, the best outcome we can hope for is some sort of damage control. Um, and I think that's just simply not good enough. And I think that a treaty can really do two great things. It can give this, you know, visionary, inspirational idea of what multilateralism can really look like and what new geopolitics can look like that are focused on a just transition. And it can also provide a shared pathway for, you know, a diverse range of civil society and social movements fighting to keep fossil fuels in the ground. And, you know, those are the two main reasons why, you know, we're supporting the treaty. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. Um, David, um, let's turn to you. Um, so you, um, and Oil Change International has recently, uh, this week, uh, released a really important report that's looking at what the oil majors are doing to align um, uh, with uh, net zero. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your report and uh, what do you think it says uh, about the importance for international uh, cooperation? Good morning and thanks. So we looked at the climate targets from eight of the largest publicly owned integrated oil and gas companies. We provided a pretty strong reality check for those targets. We know from our previous research that the oil and gas reserves in already producing or under construction fields and wells globally could push the world past 1.5 degrees, even if coal use is phased out overnight. This means that complex long-term targets or partial net zero pledges just won't cut it. So we looked at baselines for what it will be needed. Absolutely, as necessary, not sufficient criteria for an oil and gas company's target to align the 1.5 degrees. We found that where companies have set net zero targets, they exclude most of their emissions, including, in almost all cases, from customers actually burning the oil and gas that they sell. For example, Shell itself admits that its net zero target covers only 15% of the com company's total emissions. And it doesn't help that many of the scenarios and projections these targets are based on are predicated on failure in our climate ambition, including those from the IEA. Some of these oil company targets are better than others. But being a leader in a bunch of laggards won't solve the climate crisis. They are all way off track from anything like alignment with the Paris Agreement. An arsonist pledging to light a few less fires is still an arsonist. We are seeing fires across California, the West Coast, climate impacts striking people across the world especially those who are structurally oppressed by existing systems of inequality and inequity. The industry that is most responsible for getting us into this climate crisis won't get us out of it. Our report showed without a shadow of a doubt that the oil and gas industry won't do this alone. They won't do this. Investors play a key role, but most importantly, governments need to step up and step in. It's a question of when, not if, we decline in oil and gas production. This is an industry that must sunset for all our futures. For us to have a future, oil, gas, and coal must have no future. It's that simple. But to get it right, to make sure that this transition is a just one, one that looks after working people, all people, and communities, governments must step up. They need to manage the decline in fossil fuel production. Some already are. Countries like Costa Rica, France, Belize, my own home country of New Zealand, and more recently, Spain, Ireland, and Portugal have already taken bold steps to curb fossil fuel supply within their jurisdiction. This is the cutting edge of climate action, and we can expect that this club of countries taking supply side action will only grow. But 
there's a real, real question. When will the big producing countries who want to be seen as climate leaders step up? Where are countries like Norway, Canada, or the UK? And it's here also that international cooperation can and must play a key role in bringing together these countries that are already taking steps to end fossil fuel supply, in stepping up their ambition, and in bringing in the other big polluting, big producing countries. That's where initiatives like this have a critical role. Fantastic. Um, so well said. You tied so many of the threads that we've talked about already this morning together. Um, so I'm noticing um, in the chat uh, that we have questions around how do we address equity? Who gets to produce what? We have questions about the success of the Non-Proliferation Treaty and can that be used as a model? Um, we have some questions that are breaking my heart um, about the U.S. and the state of the dialogue um, right now in the U.S. Um, and um, I know um, that in the second panel, a number of those questions are gonna be addressed by the people who are specifically designing pieces to address them. So um, uh, with the leeway of a moderator, I hope the team um, in the back um, does not uh, um, uh, get annoyed. I'm just going to shift the agenda um, and open it up um, to the second panel. I'm gonna ask our first panel to come back um, and turn on their uh, videos at the end, um, we'll have a full uh, Q&A. Um, so the second panel specifically digs into this idea of a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty systems approach. And um, in this panel, um, we're going to um, hear um, from some, from uh, have some special uh, guest visits. I notice um, Naomi Klein has already joined us. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, before we go um, to, uh, to Naomi um, uh, and, and, and Bill, I want to set up this conversation um, with a, a short uh, video uh, that has been uh, produced uh, by the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Initiative uh, to introduce the concept to the world. The first time it will be shown publicly is here at Climate Week right now. The generation that grew up with nuclear weapons were told to hide under their desks in case of attack. This generation faces an even greater threat, the climate crisis, but they have nowhere to hide. While citizens, cities and countries are working to reduce their emissions, behind our backs, the coal, oil and gas industry continues to rapidly expand fossil fuels, driving catastrophic warming. Surviving the climate crisis requires a bold new idea. Introducing the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Why a treaty? 50 years ago, the world signed a non-proliferation treaty to avoid nuclear war. In 1987, the Montreal Protocol protected the ozone. The Paris Agreement begins to limit emissions but doesn't mention coal, oil or gas. We need a global agreement to end the proliferation of fossil fuels and fast-track solutions. A fossil fuel treaty would phase out coal, oil and gas faster, more fairly and forever while supporting workers, communities and countries dependent on fossil fuels. People around the world are already winning the frontline battles against coal, oil and gas projects. A treaty can bring together these diverse efforts into a powerful and equitable global plan. Endorse the fossil fuel treaty and together we can drive a just transition to clean energy and a safe climate for generations to come. Thank you, Meredith, uh, for showing that video. Um, uh, I don't know, for those of you uh, who work in, in, in this field, you'll know that trying to get a global concept um, into 1.4 uh, uh, minutes um, with, a, with a steering committee that represents people from around the world is no mean feat. And so I just want to thank all of the uh, folks who contributed to uh, developing that. Um, excited to see it uh, shown here at Climate Week for the first time. Um, so we're going to move to our second panel now, and this panel um, is looking specifically at the idea of the treaty, um, and we have another fantastic uh, group of experts 
joining us now, uh, we have Bill McKibben, uh, the founder of 350 and also author of many incredible uh, books. We have Richard Folland, um, the who is on the International Treaty Support Team, Senior Policy and Government Affairs Advisor for Carbon Tracker since 2014. We have Naomi Klein, of course, Naomi, who probably needs no introduction, but is an award-winning New York Times bestselling um, author. Uh, Peter Newell, uh, Professor of International Relations at the University of, of, of Sussex, um, and one of the first academics to publish uh, on the idea of the treaty. Carol Muffet. Carol is the president and the CEO of the Center for International Environmental Law. And Nicholas Hallström. Nicholas is the director of What Next, a Sweden-based organization active in policy work and research. Um, and is Nicholas is working on the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty through research and strategies on how to fast track uh, renewable energy and economic diversification. We'll have Gregor Robertson, the Executive Vice President of Strategy and Partners with Nexi Building Solutions. Um, he's also the 30, he was the 39th mayor of Vancouver, where he was an incredible advocate for climate action and oversaw the creation and implementation of the Greenest City 2020 Action Plan. And Lucina Tilly will make a guest appearance, um, we hope. Um, Lucina is, of course, uh, one of the world's uh, leading uh, youth activists and voices. Um, she's been affiliated with Switzerland Climate Strike, um, and she'll be uh, joining us uh, from the Climate Strike. So um, without further ado, um, uh, let's go um, to, um, to you, uh, Bill. Thank you so much for joining us. I know um, how busy you are. You, you track um, and regularly report on financial institutions, government and companies and, and other inst institutions moving out of fossil fuels. And we know uh, we definitely need to follow the money. Um, but markets alone can't solve the climate crisis. So uh, c would you uh, tell us, do you see increased international cooperation as critical to complement the finance efforts? And when it comes to grassroots organizations, what are the benefits around rallying around something this bold, a common idea? Well, Zipporah, so first of all, many thanks for your hard work and many thanks for asking me to, to get to be a part of this. It's a real um, honor. Um, look, the climate crisis is by far the biggest thing that human beings have ever done. Uh, the biggest problem that we've ever faced. It ranges, you know, its solutions require uh, huge shifts uh, in technology, in economics, in politics, in individual behavior, uh, in international relations. And we have to fight it on absolutely every front at the same time. There's no one strategy that solves all our problems. Um, it's going to be some mix of pressure coming from so many directions. And that's why, you know, some of us end up you know, sitting in jail because we're opposed to pipelines and then sitting in jail because we're trying to get banks to stop lending to the fossil fuel industry and because we're trying to get uh, governments to change uh, policies and on and on and on. I think that this in particular is an exquisitely important idea in part because one of the things that we always are doing is sort of triggering a set of associations and metaphors and images in people's minds. You know, the, the link between our understanding of nuclear weapons and our understanding of fossil fuel uh, uh, is not as tight as it probably should be. Um, nuclear weapons, the explosion at Alamogordo and then at Hiroshima and Nagasaki these were the first intimations that human beings had suddenly become very, very large, that we were no longer kind of buffeted by the physical forces around us, that we were doing a lot of the buffeting. And our response in terms of nuclear weapons has, all things considered, been pretty remarkable. We haven't dropped another one for decades. And that's because the human imagination was able to understand what those mushroom clouds above big cities looked like the human imagination has been less able to understand that the explosion of a billion pistons in a billion cylinders every minute of every day could wreak the same kind of damage. And so we haven't taken action to forestall it, but now, now our imaginations don't need any real help. 
we can see the fires, we can see the melt, we can see the heat waves. And so the time has come for us to understand that this is another example of people and our systems become simply too large for the planet that we inhabit. And this is a remarkably good way of organizing some of that sentiment into real action. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, you're, you have the remarkable ability um, to say so much uh, about the global frame and then so clear um, about next steps, um, inspired um, as always. Um, I'm gonna uh, shift uh, the agenda a little bit um, and hold on to um, some of the panelists because I know um, uh, Naomi and Lukina have both joined us and um, have uh, both uh, crazy uh, schedules today. Um, Naomi, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, this morning. Um, we can take this conversation in so many directions, but your recent book on fire um, chronicles stories of communities facing the impacts of climate change, as well as growing social movements that are emerging to take on the challenge. Um, can you uh, uh, share some examples to make that live here? And from your perspective, can increased cooperation align fossil fuel production uh, with a 1.5 C world and support these efforts for Green New Deals uh, around the world and other mobilizing efforts? Sure. Um, well, hi, everyone. It is great to see all of you. And um, yeah, a reminder of those days when, when we used to see each other in person. Um, lots of old friends on this call. And, and uh, it really is great to see you and great to be part of this coordinated effort. Um, I think it is hard to do these sorts of coordinated efforts when we are uh, um, less mobile. So it is really an accomplishment that, that you've managed to do. And thank you so much, Sapora, for inviting me. And Bill, it is so good to see you. Good to see you looking relatively healthy uh, as well. I know there's been, uh, <laughs> you're a good faker. Um, yeah, so you know, the book that you mentioned, Sapora, <laughs> came out a year ago. Um, the, 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 the fire was not metaphorical, as, we all, as we've known for a long time. The fires are real. We've been living them. And, you know, I have an essay in the book about uh, um, this, what I call the summer of smoke in 2017, uh, which looks tame compared to what we have just been through. And, of course, you know, we are living in this time of intersecting fires, right? Um, the political fires, the fires of, you know, far right fascism marching in the streets, fires burning down refugee camps in Europe, um, fires burning down forests um, in the part of the world where I am. I'm in British Columbia right now, but we've been choked in the smoke from fires from Washington State and Oregon and California. Um, and, 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 and cities on fire with injustice um, and police impunity and violence, um, state sanctioned violence and murder of black people, including in their own homes. Um, you know, I say in the book, and I've been saying as I've been, you know, speaking about it since even more that we need to find our own fire <laughs> in a moment like this, right? Um, and, you know, one of the reasons why the fires are spreading as quickly as they are in um, the Pacific Northwest has to do with theft of indigenous land and suppression of indigenous knowledge that has told us that we actually need to live with fire. Um, and, and we can't suppress it and treat it as an en enemy because fire is part of life. Um, so I think within our movements, we need to always be locating our fire, which is the fire that, that rises up to resist injustice and cruelty and impunity. Um, and, and unfortunately, we have climate treaties that have not had their fight. That's how you can have you know, a Paris climate accord that does not say the words oil, gas, or coal. Um, so, you know, I, I find myself, you know, thinking about this treaty, I find myself thinking about that, you know, the Zapatista slogan um, of way back in the, in the late 1990s, um, one no and many yeses, right? Um, because I think that this is a big no that makes the yeses of, the, of those democratically developed 
just transitions, green new deals that recognize the intersection of so many different injustices and, 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 and recognizes climate change as a threat multiplier, right? Um, and, and brings uh, some different, different constituencies and sectors and communities to the table to design what a green new deal would look like. That's, th those are the yeses and there isn't just one yes. But in order for them to be possible and meaningful, we need this big no, right? Which is, which, which is gonna keep the problem from getting so bad that there is no yes that is really possible, right? There, that, and so, um, you know, that's the exciting piece of this. And, you know, I would just kind of, kind of add that the moment that we're in, as bleak as it is, right, with all of those fires, um, when, you know, I, I've been talking about this idea of, of, of some kind of Green New Deal-ish thing for a long time, you know, we called it the leap five years ago when we launched it in Canada. When I wrote this Changes Everything, I quoted Angelica Navarro, the brilliant um, former climate negotiator for Bolivia, calling for a Marshall Plan for Planet Earth in 2009 in Bonn. Um, so this idea has been around, you know, and it's gone by many names. Um, but what I, what I think is striking from uh, talking about it now as opposed to talking about it even six months ago or seven months ago, is that the big pushback has always been, it's too much, it's too big, it's too expensive, it's too sweeping. Why are you adding all of these other, you know, why are you talking about healthcare and why are you talking about indigenous rights and can't we just deal with carbon and trying to narrow it down, right? Um, if there's one good thing I can say about the moment that we're in and there's not much, um, it's that I think we get that, that every, every large scale crisis contains every other crisis within it. Um, there's no prying them apart. And COVID has shown us that so vividly, right? And I think the, the, the beauty and brilliance of a Green New Deal framing or a Marshall Plan for Planet Earth is that these are moments in our collective history when in moments of deep crisis, including deep economic crisis, or the ravages of war, there have been these um, th these these solutions on the scale of the crisis itself, and I think um, you know, as I said, just like seven months ago, you would still encounter this pushback of you know, well, like the economy is doing pretty well, why would we do something so big? Nobody is saying that now. <laughs> At least in a moment like this, we get um, how deep in the hole we are on so many different fronts, and so I think our chances of doing something ambitious um, are, are greater if we can find our fire. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Lukina, uh, I know that you have an incredibly busy day. I just appreciate uh, especially you joining us um, this morning on, um, well, or evening for you um, on a day of the global climate strike. Um, and uh, wanted to uh, bring you into the conversation before you have to go. I know all three of you have crazy schedules um, today and we deeply appreciate you joining the treaty conversation. Um, Lukina, can, can you give us your thoughts um, on the fossil fuel treaty and, and whether, you know, or how it could dovetail with and support uh, the work of the growing youth movement and, and potentially create opportunities uh, for youth leaders to shape the initiative as we move forward? Yes, um, thank you so, so much for inviting me and letting me speak today. Um, yeah, I've just been to the strike and it's still happening somewhere in the city which have been occupied for the whole, well, we have been doing some occupation, uh, so civil disobedience here in the capital of Switzerland. And so regarding the treaty directly, um, I, I think, you know, we've been saying since the beginning, keep it in the ground at every strike. So now it's like directly explaining in a concrete um, way how how do we how is it possible to make it happen uh, with the legislation behind and all of the complicated stuff that we might not get from our young age sometimes but um yeah i, I definitely think it's it's filling up this gap which is missing in the paris agreement in the first place and that we absolutely need um now and um it also completely aligns with the basic demands that we have or that the basic demands we've been seeing in the 
in the youth movement since the beginning, which is um, to stay below the 1.5 degrees uh, target, it's following the climate justice principle and um, also basing our reflection on the best science available. And I know that you've been also really connecting all of these dots together. Um, and it's, it's bringing up uh, those kind of initiatives as the, as the treaty. And, and also I think it's, it's helping to move forward in the fight between generation, because we always say that, you know, your genera generation have, has been failing us uh, regarding the climate crisis, but uh, it lagged. We can hear you. You can hear, okay. Um, sorry, <laughs> quick. Um, but I think it's also a way to move forward that sort of um, fight we can have endlessly between the two generation and just or whatever generation you are part of, but really go further that and being, okay, now we unite and we, we have this uh, initiative and we know that we have to keep it in the ground and it's not with compensation and technologies that we will uh, go somewhere because those technologies are still like not really working on that big scale. Um, so yeah, and, and also I, I thought today about this point, which is that, um, I mean, we as young generation always are like many times are being told that we are giving hope to other generation. But for us, it's also sometimes hard to find hope anywhere because wherever we look at, we are just seeing that the problem is not being facing as it should. And I think having such initiative, personally, it's giving me hope that we can move and really bring strong and bold um, um, climate policies and climate tools for uh, moving out of fossil fuels as, as a whole society. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of my, my perspective. And thank you so, so much. And I'm excited to work f like forward and, and then see how, because the whole cl youth climate movement is connected between the countries also. So how we can use this whole network and, and young people are going to support it, I think, um, because it's very aligned with what we say in general, I think. So yes, thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lukina, um, especially, especially on today. Um, uh, and to all of uh, our guest speakers um, mm -hmm. who have come in today. I know um, it is a crazy day and really appreciate your perspectives. Um, uh, we talked about um, how, uh, you know, Lucini, you talked about how is it possible to make it happen? What's the how? Um, we've talked a lot this morning about equity. Who gets to produce and how much? How do we decide that? Um, and um, I'm, I'm going to uh, turn to Peter Newell now, um, who is uh, one of the first academics to really tear it apart and say, how could we do this in a new initiative, in a, in a treaty? And we've had a bunch of questions in the chat here about, about the, the reference to nuclear nonproliferation and the three pillars. Um, and, and so, Peter, can you explain the three pillars um, and what the thinking is so far? Uh, around um, how negotiating a new fossil fuel treaty and even the process to negotiating a new fossil fuel treaty can start to address these questions of how to negotiate a global just transition. Sure, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the starting point for uh, Andrew and I in thinking through this idea um, was, as, as many others have said, the obvious and uh, deliberate neglect to even mention the, the F word of <laughs> fossil fuels in, in most of the key climate agreements that we have. So this is clearly the elephant in the room that, that needed to be addressed. And a sense that struggling case by case is important and valuable, but we're going to at some point have to have a multilateral agreement to fairly leave remaining reserves of fossil fuels in the ground. So then the question was, well, what would that look like? Um, and at the time we were thinking about this, it was the 50th anniversary of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, and we were thinking about the three pillars that underpinned that treaty and the extent to which they might be carried over or offer some sort of um, structure for a, a treaty to deal with fossil fuels. And so we thought about the non-proliferation elements, which in relation to fossil fuels would be about a moratorium on further expansion in richer and primarily OECD countries underpinned by an assessment, possibly the registry that Mark was talking about earlier, 
outlining how much unburnable carbon there is. In other words, what percentage of fossil fuels would need to remain in the ground to be compliant with the Paris Agreement? And of course, from there, we can talk about the sequencing of commitments regarding different fossil fuels. So that's the first pillar, the, the non-proliferation aspect. The second is about disarmament, and that really speaks to what many people have said already about the need for an accelerated phase out and a managed decline of existing investments in infrastructures. But in doing that, as many colleagues, particularly from the Global South, have uh, emphasized, the need to do that in a way that's attentive to a just transition, both reflecting historical responsibility for the problem so far, but also uneven capacity to diversify uh, energy mixes away from fossil fuels, and so providing support to do that. So that's the second element, the disarmament. And the third is peaceful use, which uh, in the nuclear context, but carried over to the climate context, it's about financial and technological support, primarily to developing countries, but not just developing countries. Uh, and through a redirection of finance from fossil fuels, either the fossil fuel subsidies, which you know, even according to IMF figures still stand at $10 million a minute, going in the wrong direction, going towards sustaining climate chaos, can we move that money and lots of other money, including the export finance that Lily and others were talking about before, can we move that into a fund that can actually support the much needed low carbon energy transition throughout the world? So that's why we were attracted to these three pillars. Fantastic. Um, so how is it going? How is the response uh, to this initiative so far? I mean, this is the first time we've really talked about it um, in a big way publicly with the release of the video and this panel. Um, but um, there have been a, a group of us uh, from around the world who have been having uh, meetings um, and discussing this concept uh, for about a year now. Um, Richard, let me turn to you. Um, you have a long history of diplomatic efforts on climate and finance work with Carbon Tracker. You're working now on the treaty initiative. Uh, what kind of response uh, are you getting? What kind of pathway do you see uh, for the treaty in the coming years. And Meredith, if you could take the slide off so we can see uh, Richard, that would be fantastic. Great, um, Zipporah, thank you. And hello, um, uh, good morning or good afternoon um, from the UK. And thanks very much to the great contributions so far. So uh, first in answer to your question about the sort of response that we're getting on the treaty. Uh, I mean, I think I, I would say that responses um, are, are varying. Some of the diplomats, they instinctively react ag against it. Um, uh, they will say they see how difficult it is to um, a green international treaty and Paris itself isn't a treaty for that reason. Um, uh, and they say that, you know, agreeing it is gonna take time and time is not on our side. But then if I think of some of the other responses from diplomatic colleagues, um, uh, and uh, I would highlight here from the small island states, um, uh, they recognize the need, they take encouragement uh, from progress uh, in other areas. I think we had referenced um, uh, on the landmines treaty earlier, for example. And I think overall, this is a key point, that interlocutors, they acknowledge it makes sense to consider what can be done um, uh, to tackle the supply side at the international level in that context of international cooperation. And particularly, and I'm starting to see this a little bit, those who, who maybe um, have Im implemented or are implementing um, uh, domestic policy measures, um, uh, for example, to restrict the production of oil and gas and see opportunities to leverage their actions in the international, in the global arena. So, so, so that's what I'm saying in terms of the response I'm getting. And then on your question about the pathway, and I'm glad you've asked about that. I mean, in short, um, I would say it's step by step, building block upon building block. And, and Rebecca talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, I mean, we're avoiding getting sucked into detailed, tricky um, discussions about the treaty at this stage. But what we're finding is it's more profitable to create political space focusing on the supply side, our global systems approach, um, uh, and that in, then enables us to bring in early tangible priorities, um, like the global registry, which, which Mark and Peter have talked about. And also, I think what we heard about earlier, the idea of a first movers club, those who, who might sort of go beyond oil and gas exiting early. And the idea of the registry is getting some traction because stakeholders, they, they get these principles of transparency and accountability. 
Um, uh, and the, the question can be, well, why not on the registry as opposed to why? And then further down the track, we hope that building support and momentum can lead the idea of the, the World Commission on Fossil Fuels, which Rebecca mentioned earlier. And, and there may be one lesson we can take from what's been done um, uh, in tackling the nuclear weapons issue is how these internationally convened conferences and bodies, they can raise awareness and they can shine a light on a global issue. And, you know, and then in turn leading to, to, to the treaty itself, which I guess would be that ultimate outcome of international cooperation. I think two other points briefly, if I may, Sapora, to uh, one, which is to emphasize, I mean, I'm handling primarily European political engagement, but others are leading on discussions with the Global South, and it's vital these initiatives are not viewed as, mm -hmm. as European or, or, or Western centric. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree. Um, I'm going to I'm going to stop you there because um, that's a point. So I what if people who have been uh, sending uh, questions, um, you may note um, that what I'm doing is I'm building them into the conversation as we go. There are so many great panelists. It's very difficult to start stop and then start a QA. and a And we have about 16 minutes left um, on our webinar. Um, so what I've been doing is just building them into the conversation as we go. If we haven't addressed your question, we will be sending out written answers um, to anyone who registered along with the link afterwards. So feel free uh, to keep asking your questions to our experts um, in the chat. Um, Liddy, I want to turn back to you. Um, uh, if you could uh, turn your camera on um, again. Um, and because this question of leading from the Global South, Richard just raised it, it's come up a number of times in the question, the question um, around uh, equity. You and I have spoken a number of times about how the treaty needs to be driven by the grassroots. It needs, um, in particular, uh, to be driven by civil society um, in, in the Global South. Can you speak a bit more uh, to those issues? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, I, I would like to emphasize that it needs to be driven from the bottom up. So we need movements everywhere in the north and, of course, in the global south to push this. And one of the first uh, reasons for this is because we know our governments from our long experience of pushing uh, for climate just solutions to the problem of climate chaos is that governments are not going to move unless we compel them, unless we force them to move. And that is why we need movements. And we need movements, especially in the global South to drive this because we also have the greatest at stake here. It's not just about capital or profits or technology or infrastructure. It's really about our lives. It's not giving up something that we have. It's really fighting for survival and hopefully a much better a world for people of the global south and people everywhere, of course. But we also have to emphasize that we are here also as a big reminder that this is not just about transitioning from fossil fuel to clean and renewable energy. It has to be a process that encompasses other changes in society that we need in order to build it in a more just and fair uh, society. Mm -hmm. So. It's not just about simply having clean and renewable energy systems. They have to be energy systems that address the needs of people and community first. And secondly, it has to be democratic energy systems. And thirdly, it has to be energy systems that power economies that are fairer and more equitable and more just. So we need to make sure that this agenda is very squarely part of the process of the energy transition. Absolutely. You know, we've had a bunch of questions about, um, but don't we already have the Paris Accord? Um, and, and can't these issues uh, be addressed within the UNFCCC? I want to bring you, Carol, um, into the conversation here. Um, how could a treaty uh, relate uh, to the UNFCCC? And, 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 you know, are these issues, well, we've heard today many times the issues are not being addressed within the Paris Accord, but um, what's the relationship and, and, and what do you think about this idea? Yeah, I think, it's, I think as you've heard again and again, these issues are not addressed in the Paris Agreement, but much more fundamentally, they're not in being addressed in the UN after we'll see more than 25 years after that convention was being addressed. And they're not addressed for a very fundamental reason. The power 
the, the power and the leverage of the fossil fuel industry within that agreement and within key governments in that agreement has crippled the ability to really confront this fundamental aspect of the climate crisis. And this speaks to me not only about the importance of, of a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty for addressing the critical indispensable role of fossil fuels in the climate crisis, but the value of that treaty in addressing some of the other threats from fossil fuels that Liddy was alluding to. I think it's really important to recognize that, that fossil fuels and oil and gas particular, particularly, yes, they are critical drivers of the climate crisis. They also threaten human rights. They threaten governance. They lead to corruption. They've been linked to war. They lead to widespread environmental contamination, encroachment on indigenous lands. All of these are aspects of the fossil fuel crisis that communities around the world are confronting every day. And the UNFCCC has proven that it is not ready to deal with that critical aspect of the crisis. And that brings to me not only to the role that a fossil fuel non-proliferation -prolifer treaty can play in this approach, but how we go about doing that. And I think that's what's so exciting because ultimately when we realize that this treaty is about responding to not only the fundamental climate threat from fossil fuels, but to those other threats that it is imposing on communities around the world, we recognize that the movements there to fight it are already in place and they're massive if we recognize that we're working together. And I think the power of the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty is that it begins with campaigns that has to, and those campaigns are already in place. People who are fighting to stop fracking in their town, in their, in their state, are fighting to stop the proliferation of fossil fuels. People are fighting to stop oil and gas development off their coasts or in Arctic waters, or to keep it from spreading in the Amazon. They are fighting against the proliferation of fossil fuels. And so by recognizing that we're fighting in this common cause, by saying my town is a fossil fuel non-proliferation zone, my state is a non not fossil fuel non-proliferation zone. My country is a non-proliferation zone. We give ourselves the opportunity to ratchet up ambition, demand greater ambition from our own leaders. And for those countries who are ready to move first and early, we give them a way to signal to the markets that this is where the whole world is going. This change is inevitable. Um, and, and you have to respond. Fantastic. You know, you've raised the um, uh, uh, awareness around commu what communities are doing uh, around the world. And, you know, we've talked about the role of um, international agreements now, a new treaty. We've talked about um, the importance of nation states uh, uh, addressing this. Um, we're also seeing local governments take action to stop fossil fuel expansion, um, significant action from banning new gas stations um, to um, changing the way uh, people move about cities to how we heat our homes. Um, Gregor, I want to bring you into the conversation now. Y you've commented on a couple of panels um, this year that I've heard you on about how frustrating it can be for cities leading on climate if their national governments are failing to act or push projects that move backwards. I know you had this experience as mayor of Vancouver when you fought the Trans Mountain Pipeline that our federal government eventually bought with taxpayers' dollars. Um, can, can you comment on this and the role of cities in, a, in something like a treaty initiative? I'd love to, and I, I'm honored to be uh, to with, with you all and, and to, to listen in to all this. It's been fascinating. At, at the community level, at the city level, um, you know, there, there is um, a supply side angle. You know, we've, we've been able to block infrastructure uh, using land use and air quality jurisdiction. We managed to stop thermal coal export here and, and really up and down the west coast of North America. Uh, cities and communities have been blocking that. States uh, and province also involved. So subnational governments have been effective at stopping infrastructure, but, uh, but you know, largely they can get forced through by national governments. Um, I, you did speak to the importance of the demand side and cities and communities have to step up and deal with the demand side. Um, there are lots of tools, lots of opportunities, and there's, there's lots of commitments and legislation now and climate action happening at, at the city and community level. So there, there's an encouraging movement that's happened because people are electing local officials and holding them accountable for 
dealing with the demand side and, and uh, phasing out the use of fossil fuels in our cities. But uh, that, that uh, the advocacy piece is really crucial. And I think the organizations and networks of cities and communities have been really important in, in pulling us together to advocate uh, and, and to push at, at the Paris, at the UNF, uh, C at that level to make sure the voices of cities and communities are heard. Um, I think we're an important piece of the puzzle, um, both on the supply and demand side. And the more uh, the more coordination and effort we have, like the, like the approach with the treaty, uh, the better. Like we, we, we have to have more to push forward and deal with the supply side um, so that we can keep pushing on the demand side as well at a local level. And I, I'll just come back to the, the absolute importance of political activism here. We have to elect people who will not only say straight up that they are going to help phase out fossil fuels as aggressively as possible, but they're going to do it. And we have to hold them accountable and we have to elect them at every level of government. And that, you know, that's where we have democracy. We have to use it with everything we've got right now to get people in there who can make this change and regulate and make sure it's, it's a just transition and supports everyone. So political activism is, is essential here and following through to, to make sure that both the demand and the supply side are dealt with. Fantastic, um, thank you. Um, and so I, I, I can't believe it, but I'm gonna turn um, to our, our last speaker. I, I feel like we all need some kind of um, award for um, being able to uh, uh, get to all of these incredible uh, voices from around the world on this critical issue. Um, uh, Nicholas, uh, Naomi shared the incredible frame of one no and many yeses. And I know uh, that you um, with the treaty group have been working on the idea of how do we fast track the solutions? What are the yeses? And how does the equity piece come into that? How can uh, addressing production um, through a lens of equity um, you know, lead to those fast tracking of uh, the yeses? So we're gonna, we're gonna end our conversation um, with you um, on the hope, the solutions and the equity. Nicholas, no pressure. Oh, you're muted. First off, let's let's get it so we can hear you. Thank you. Sorry. Um, thanks so much for, uh, for for that. And uh, yeah, I'm sitting here. I've been in Sápmi actually, in Sámiland in northern Sweden. Um, well, I also picked up on Anomi's uh, brilliant points and and the one no many yeses, and I really feel that's exactly where where I'm situated in this incredible endeavor, which I must say is it's just so such a such a such a um, an experience to be able to be a part of all the pieces which we haven't seen much of. So I've been working a lot on the renewable side, and 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 in the th third pillar, as as um, um, Peter also said. We have three pieces here. We, we talk about the renewable energy transition, 100% renewables, faster than um, we could ever have imagined. Um, and secondly, the just transition piece. And thirdly, the economic diversification. So these are all three sub dimensions that all needs to be there. And, and I, I think one point here, just to say in the beginning, in a way, this is the biggest thing. The, the two first pillars we've been talking about so far are absolutely amazingly big challenges, but the third pillar, of course, is about everything. It's transforming our societies at the very, very core. And I think while we look to the, the opportunities and all the possibilities in fast tracking, as you said, I think we also need to be very clear that we cannot do this without simultaneously talking about development, progress, the whole kind of systemic problems we're facing. And, and again, which Nomi, uh, among others, have been uh, so incredibly um, good at, at, at exposing and laying out. Um, I think um, on the renewable side, um, yeah, 100% renewables, that's, that's an incredibly um, exciting idea. It is possible. And I think one piece here that we're, 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 we're of course need to recognize is that it's not just about shifting fuels, it's about a different model in itself. And that has incredible promises, e economic democratization diversified ownership, uh, non-profit oriented uh, uh, production of, of energy, uh, communities, cooperatives, um, uh, people can produce energy wherever they are, consume and produce at the same time. Um, developing countries uh, to look at the equity part. Um, the, 
they can move faster than, than many of us in the rich part. Uh, they can do the right thing from the very beginning. Uh, again, the distributed, smart, people-centered uh, uh, um, renewable energy model. Um, they will save money. It's already cheaper. Um, but we also need to see that this can only happen through international cooperation. There's a lot of capital that needs to go in here right away, primarily and, and, and of course, preferentially to those who really can be the good movers here, not just the big corporations uh, finding new markets, but actually driving local development. That needs a Marshall Plan, as was said. We need the treaty to voice also the, the, the sensible things that needs to be put in place now so that countries, communities, corporations and others can do the right thing right away. And that means, for example, feed-in tariffs, it means shifting subsidies, it means, it means uh, providing the, the upfront uh, resources, which will generate savings very, very quickly, obviously. And uh, I think that's what we're playing with and to see what, to what extent can the treaty build in some of these things. And of course the treaty can't in its treaty sense do everything, but it's also a place for campaigning, bringing the dots together and generate a whole lot of excitement around all these good real zero solutions that we see across sectors. And of course, again, for producers, how can you find meaningful ways and, and good ways to generate other kinds of incomes. We cannot expect countries that are heavily dependent on fossil fuels to just give it up and not have another means of, especially uh, paying for their social services, the government uh, expenditures and so on. So of course that's part of the, 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 the challenge here too, but we know these solutions. There are better ways of organizing societies that are, again, uh, vastly different, uh, but much, much better for everyone. And in the end of the day, it, it's really about equity and consumption some need to, to reduce. And I just thought, if you haven't seen it, look into this recent publication um, on the carbon inequality era, uh, which really looks at the elites across societies. And it's just mind blowing, uh, the clear, mm -hmm. you know, where the problem lies. So um, that's just a few points, but uh, we'll see how, where we end up in terms of um, these solutions uh, as part of the, 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 uh, the other uh, dimensions of the, uh, the treaty mm -hmm. work. Thank you so much. Um, and for those that had a number of questions of how do we do this? How do we, how do we figure out the equity question? I wanna point you to an incredible paper by Shivan Kartha and Greg Mutit. They were unable to join us today. They really have really begun um, uh, developing the depth that this conversation needs to really understand um, how we address equity uh, from a production perspective. Um, we are at time. We have one last very quick uh, poll we're gonna ask you to do. Um, Meredith, you want to put that up on the screen? Um, and um, if you can, um, uh, please uh, vote. It helps us learn about what uh, we need to do in talking about this initiative uh, publicly um, in the future. Um, and um, I, I, you know, I, I want to um, end by first of all thanking the w well over 100 people from around the world who have joined us for the entire hour and a half, especially thanking all of our speakers today. Um, for joining us um, to have this incredibly important uh, conversation. We will make the video available as well as answers to many of the questions um, that uh, you've asked in the Q&A. Um, and, you know, in, I guess in closing, I want to say um, this is an idea uh, whose time has come. Um, we are already receiving interest from governments on the Global Registry of Fossil Fuels uh, we're seeing youth leaders around the world leading the way again um, and, are, and are already starting to launch uh, campaigns calling for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, including in New Zealand, where school striker Aureli uh, Bray has already delivered a petition uh, to the New Zealand parliament calling for a treaty. Dozens of organizations have expressed interest in bidding on the prototype for the global registry um, under our competitive tender process. Partners and colleagues throughout Africa and Asia are already starting to take under uh, undertake comprehensive political economy analysis in their regions to build treaty evidence and underpin this work. Um, and, uh, and most importantly, around the world, we're seeing grassroots groups and indigenous uh, leaders waging campaigns on the ground against new fossil fuel expansion. Um, they are, as many have mentioned, uh, the uh, who have started um, this work. Um, and the treaty initiative hopes to uh, support their work um, and uh, lift it up through a global call for a treaty. 
hundreds of organizations and companies and individuals have already endorsed the treaty, although we haven't been a live campaign yet, including many we've heard from today, but also I wanna note PowerShift Africa, 350.org, Friends of the Earth International, Corporate Accountability, the UK Youth Climate Coalition, and yesterday, the World Future Council, already endorsed, and many, many others. You can join them. Help us figure out the principles uh, behind this kind of treaty. Help us raise the conversation about the need to constrain the expansion of fossil fuels so we all have a climate safe world. Please join us by endorsing the treaty at fossilfueltreaty.org. And thank you all so much for joining us here at Climate Week for this important conversation. Stay safe.